thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Um, we are uh, beginning, I apologize, a couple, uh, one minute after <laughs> five, um, but I'd like to start with some introductions just to allow um, folks to enter in uh, in case they're having some trouble. Um, so I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Gabrielle Tillenberg. I am the exhibitions coordinator at Strathmore. Um, part of my job is facilitating our tours um, as well as exhibition support. And so um, while we are uh, during this time of staying at home or, or limited excursions to the outside world, we are very happy to offer these virtual art artist talks um, to talk with artists who we, we've worked with in the past or artists that we've worked with or will be working with in the future or in this case both. Um, so we are um, conducting a series of four talks each. We already conduct, uh, conducted one full series and the recordings are available online at strathmore.org if you'd like to check them out. Um, but to kick off our next series, um, we are being joined by Melinda Fabian. Melinda Fabian, could you uh, say hello for us? Yes, hello and thank you for having me. I really appreciate being able to um, show my artwork and uh, thank you so much for asking me to, to join in in art talks. Appreciate Fabulous. It. Thanks for stopping in. Of course and um, for those who may not be aware um, Melinda Fabian has participated in exhibitions at Strathmore particularly through um, the Miniature Painter Sculptors Engraver Society annual show Fine Art in Miniature um, where she's had uh, miniature artworks made out of uh, paper. And uh, she also participated in Large Scale, which um, was an exhibition that uh, ran alongside the miniature exhibition um, as a means to showcase, um, you know, how artists um, can also work in large scale. So Melinda certainly works in, in different sizes and her medium that we're exploring today is paper. But um, you may, you know, think, okay, paper, we see drawings on paper, painting on paper, um, but she's a paper sculptor. And um, her work will actually be featured in our upcoming exhibition, Paper Works, curated by Leslie Lundgren, um, which is opening the day after Labor Day. Um, and she has some very exciting things planned for that show. So Melinda, could you uh, first tell us a little bit about what your medium is, just for those who are unaware of paper, how paper sculpting works, um, and then explain uh, the exciting project you're working on for this fall. Sure, sure I'd be happy to. Uh, so I, I'm a paper sculpture artist. And uh, it starts out as flat paper, flat white paper. And I bend, fold, uh, cut it and uh, to make a three-dimensional objects. Uh, sometimes I also do a flat painting and then I'll bring out certain elements in the flat painting to make it three-dimensional. And um, for the show, uh, for Paperworks, I'm going to be uh, creating a whole entire scene and I'm calling it a charming Victorian country garden retreat. Uh, and for the installation, it's quite large. It's the largest uh, installation I've ever done. It's about 18 feet by 12 feet. And um, it's going to be what I, I hope what viewers see is a calm, peaceful, joyful scene. And as they enter the scene, they'll see wisteria hanging from the ceiling. They'll see a flower garden of tulips and peonies and uh, some roses, rose trellises and climbing roses. And as they uh, enter, see the, the whole scene, there's a front porch of the country house. And on the front porch, you'll see some family pets. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, it makes you feel joyful and happy. And as you continue to look at the scene, um, I, you might find some hidden critters. There might be some squirrels and birds flying uh, above or you might notice some little ladybugs or butterflies so I just you know hope that it, it really um, shows that I want to create scenes that show habitats um, our own habitat you know where we can feel peaceful and joyful but also habitats of the animals that live around us and you know reminding us of the little things that we don't always notice uh, but if you look closely you'll see them in your own habitat yeah, and I should um, also mention um, that uh, or bring up that everything around you is paper. So even the, the piece behind you will be a part of that installation and is made out of paper. 
Right. Yes, those are the walls. Or, well, it's a section, a small section of the walls. So the white siding that you see, that's actually paper. And the bricks on the other side, that is also paper. It's painted paper. Yeah, so so that's just a small portion of the, the walls of the, the house. So speaking of getting a little closer, um, let me share my screen so we can uh, take a look at some uh, images that allow you to, to get really close up. Um, so this here is rusty um, and again, totally made out of paper. Um, there's some information on the right um, for those interested in terms of date and size. And we have, um, uh, if we zoom in, we can see just all of the texture visible. So you do have this piece directly in front of you. So for those wondering, it is it is quite large. It's life size as um, most of what you're working on for the show um, is life size. Um, so in looking at this, um, you know, I think it can become clear that you're using paper as fur. So can you talk about your technique and how um, you construct both the form, but then also the texture of the work? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so for the uh, animals, for what I do is I um, will first think about uh, what I want the animal to look like. You know, is he going to be sitting or standing, running, jumping, that sort of thing. And then I start to draw out some thumbnail sketches. I look up uh, some reference materials. And then I start thinking about the, the shape and the form of the animal, you know, how the anatomy, just like if I were going to do a drawing of the animal, it's the same similar process where you want to think about the anatomy of the animal. And then I start constructing the three dimensional quality of the animal. So I start, uh, if you can kind of sort of imagine, like, uh, think of it like you're building the skeleton shape and then building upon that to make it, a, and I make them a solid form. And inside there aren't any wires, it is just paper. So um, I create the paper, it's paper and glue inside uh, to construct the bodies. And then once I have the body formed and it's like a strong structure that will stay standing, then I will start uh, attaching the fur. And um, that's, as you can imagine, a long and tedious process, but I don't know, I just really like it. I, in some ways, I, I guess it's almost calming uh, to me. And um, yeah, I, I hope that he comes across as fluffy, like I wanted him to look soft and fluffy, that sort of a look and uh, also have some character. So yeah, that's kind of how the basics, you know, of the animals. And I and would uh, like to stop, I'm going to stop the sharing process so people can um, see that it is next to you because we have yep, right here. <laughs> a fun little question for folks. Um, so um, would you like to explain sort of the, the choice you're making with this current piece? Sure. sure, I'd be happy to. Okay, so being an artist, I don't know, I, I think probably many artists, as they're creating something, they often will have questions and they're not, they're not sure like which direction to go with their pieces. And I'll, when I get to a situation like that, I'm not sure what to do, I'll often ask, you know, different people to get their opinions. So my question is for this, for Rusty, I was debating whether or not I should, if he should have his tongue sticking out. So do you like him with his tongue sticking out or? Do you like them better without his tongue? <laughs> and I actually have a poll, so I'm going to launch that poll today. So if you uh, feel so inclined to offer an opinion, um, I see some coming in already. It, it would be great to, to hear that. So far um, with our kids this morning, all of them did vote for the tongue to be sticking out. Uh, <laughs> 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 Probably indicative of the age or age group there. Um, so uh, as those come come in, um, you know, we'll we'll touch back on that poll and, uh, sure. and see what people what people think. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's just like a funny thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you know, we have an example here without the tongue and with the oh, tongue. Yeah. So really, just um, it's yeah, really wonderful good... that you came to that. Uh, you know, sort of fork in the road and, and still made it, but made it so that you could go back and forth. I think that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, oops, 
we went too far. So we also have a corgi. So there's all sorts of animals that you're working on. Um, and um, so here we see the different patterning um, in the uh, in the fur. So uh, what materials are and techniques are you using to um, color the piece? Because you do color it after you've crafted the full form. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, yes, I start out as with white. I start out with white paper, and then I paint them in watercolor and gouache. So, um, yeah, you can see the the coloring on there, and I just keep applying the different layers of of gouache. And it must take uh, just quite a bit of patience because. Um, you know, too much water on your brush or too much paint at one time, um, you really just ruin all of the all of the fine work you've done here. So um, I really applaud that. I, I certainly um, have a hard time exercising patience when I work on art. <laughs> so sometimes, I can certainly appreciate that. Yeah, sometimes it is a little, I guess, daunting because you know, I'll have the finished uh, critter done or whatever the object is. It, it's finished in white paper and I think, oh, I really like it in white paper. And then I think, well, but now I have to go to that next step of painting it. And then I, you know, sometimes I think, okay, so you go about it. I just go about it very slowly in the beginning at times, you know, especially when I feel that way, I just go very slowly. And, uh, but you know, you get there and you feel like you know, you just, they just add more character when they're painted. Absolutely. And speaking of adding character, you did mention, um, in the in the last uh, uh, um, uh, tour with their or talk with the kids um, that you wanted to create some movement here uh, right. with this piece. So um, uh, can you talk about just like the inspiration um, for making this cat, um, the coloring, and then also um, why you chose to have the paw lifted up quite a bit? Sure. Um, I'm familiar with cats because I grew up with cats, and uh, they've always We've always had a, a kitten or a cat around. So I'm familiar with how they play and interact and they're very playful. And um, when I was decided I wanted to do, uh, to make a cat out of paper, I was trying to decide, you know, uh, is it gonna be jumping or chasing something or just standing still, like maybe watching something. Uh, so I decided for this one, I, I wanted him to look a little bit playful. He'll be sitting on the porch in the installation so I wanted him to look a little bit playful, like he's maybe looking at something or maybe he's about to scoop up a little toy or a ball or something. So that's why I decided to give him a little bit of movement. I thought it'd be a little more interesting to have him look like he uh, has a little bit of movement in him. Uh, so I brought that paw up and around. Yeah. And then Absolutely. Uh, the whiskers, I, I always feel like when I add the whiskers on a cat, it just sort of adds extra character to them as well. Um, they just sort of naturally curl, I don't know, <laughs> they kind of yeah, do their own thing. <laughs> I that it would. Um, with, so just as we move away from the animals, we have 67% um, in favor of the tongue. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> Um, so you'll also have um, some, uh, some life-size furniture. So we have an example of the table here, and we have a close-up too that we'll get to. Um, but what I really appreciate is the the weaving um, on the table. So you can see how you have this wonderful weaving pattern. Um, and then at the bottom here, and I see these spirals, which remind me of quilling. So for those right. who are familiar, quilling is um, bending um, or basically spiraling, right, paper to, to create, do you basically lay it on its side? Um, to create images that are three dimensional. Can you talk about your relationship with quilling? Sure. Um, when I was a teenager, I uh, did a lot of quilling and I, I went to craft shows and I sold quilling when I was a teenager. And then, um, you're, you know, after a couple of years, I went to college and I became an illustrator and I illustrated for over 35 years. But then um, quilling always sort of comes in and out of my illustrations. Even if you look at my illustrations, um, you'll often see little hints of quilling, like maybe I'll draw the grasses in little curly shapes and things. It, it's always there in my in my work, which I always I think that's kind of interesting. And I think that happens with many artists. You know, they're the things from long ago they still enter in and out of their art. So um, when I uh, was moving from illustrating, and uh, I decided I wanted to. I love working with paper as well as illustrating. So I wanted to create. Uh, see if I could create 
a combination of the two things, uh, paper, working with paper, and then also illustrating and making um, three-dimensional illustrations. So um, the quilling that you see on the table and all, um, yes, that is, you know, something that is from when I learned that I, when I was a teenager is how to do quilling. Um, and so that's where that came from. And, uh, and, and your work really does mix, um, you know, quilling, but also folding, you know, you yeah. know, thinking about the art of origami. Um, and then as well, as you said, painting and illustrating, um, you know, it's really t taking multiple techniques, um, right. including also paper cutting, um, and bringing them together to form, form these three-dimensional creations. Right. Um, right. Here we have a few of the desserts that will be um, on the table and uh, they certainly make me hungry, although they would not taste very good, I'm sure. <laughs> um, we have some great little chocolate spirals and we'll get some, some close-ups here. Um, I really loved how it seems that you sort of like spiraled this paper here um, to create this form and imagining the the knife making those marks uh, when you're icing the cake um, or you know uh, you know or the bonbon or whatever that is it's it's got that chocolate quality to it um, and here you know I, I was really appreciative of how um, with the rose um, it made me think about how you have some similarities in crafting these to how you would work with um, baking materials. So with fondant, you would create a rose quite similarly, um, petal by petal, forming them and shaping them, um, and then layering together. Even I would imagine the painting would be quite similar as you, if you were to paint um, fondant with, a, you usually use a very watercolor like um, edible pigment um, and having to do that quite delicately. Um, you know, how, and then on top of that, I think we talked about this earlier, it's really interesting to me that bakers, a lot of times in decorating their cakes, try to make sure everything is edible, um, and you may like to make sure everything is paper. Um, so can you talk a little bit about making these and sort of also that choice to just remain true to keeping paper the, the only material you use aside from the, the color? Right. Um... Yes, uh, for the little desserts and also the animals and things. Yes, I, I want to keep it all paper. Um, they aren't hollow inside. It is a, like the, the animals, they are a solid structure. And also as well as for the desserts, they're, you know, it's, they're, uh, it's a solid structure. And yeah, I, I just always really felt that I wanted to keep it um, just the paper. And uh, yeah, hopefully that comes through. Absolutely. I particularly like this piece because it's just very clever to me, the idea of um, using little tiny bits of cut paper to mimic the texture of the cake um, and then contrasting that with the smooth white paper as that, that yummy, delicious filling. I'm assuming it's, it's delicious if it was a cake. It looks like <laughs> it would be delicious. <laughs> yeah, and the doily on that one, I wanted to put the hearts in there. And since I put mm. hearts on the doily, I wanted to um, also put a heart on the top of the cake. And I was imagining that it's a red velvet cake. As well yes, as absolutely. Tray, it so. definitely comes across with that cream cheese icing. And then we have here um, a, another, which very clearly depicts a pie type um, dessert. Um, and I really like the coloring on this in particular. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, because you do work with watercolor and gouache, um, right. could you talk about um, the difference between the two um, and, and how you use them? Sure. So watercolor is a transparent watercolor, and you probably are familiar with that from, you know, probably have uh, worked with watercolor in school, perhaps when you were younger, or uh, maybe even today. Uh, if you're an artist, you work with watercolor, maybe. Um, and then gouache is uh, also a water medium. It's just an opaque watercolor. It's not transparent. Uh, you can't, when you apply it right from, uh, you have to really, um, you won't see the paper through it like you will with, with watercolors. So um, I, sometimes I'll, I'll mix the two. Sometimes I'm just using watercolor. It just sort of depends on the piece. So the tart that you showed that would, the, uh, the pie shell and that, that would have been probably, um, that would have been the watercolor because it, it's more transparent. 
So um, it does seem like you um, start off almost with all of your pieces with just white paper, is that correct? Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. I really appreciate that because, you know, it. I, I can assume that you could easily get uh, colored paper um, to, to work with, but um, you, you oftentimes, um, you know, you're, wh when you do uh, use your own colors, I think you often show very clearly that um, you're very in control of that, of the different tones and hues that you're using. Right. Um, right. It's very clear that um, as an artist, you're making that decision that it's it's very important to your work. Um, and one piece that I love for that reason is is this this crab um, because you get just these beautiful green and and brown tones on the shell um, that I can assume you couldn't really achieve if you were to use colored paper. Would you say that that motivates your decision to start primarily with white paper? Yes, because the thing with starting with white paper, it's like a blank canvas. So it's like re uh, back to my uh, when I illustrate, you know, you're able to start with that white piece of paper and create all those, like you said, those different tones and shapes, uh, shadows and things like that. And I don't feel that you could get that if I, the same effect if I use just a flat colored paper because it, you know, you're not able to put in all the different depths of uh, colors and things. So starting off with the white, it's, you know, that blank canvas and I can add all different shades of greens, reds, oranges, whatever, uh, to bring Absolutely. out the, the objects. Yeah, and we have quite a bit of color in this piece here. Um, so this is quite small. You can see um, it's uh, the maximum size measured from one side to another here is 10 inches. Um, would you say um, working smaller creates a different challenge or in what sort of, does that change your practice at all? Um, when I make the uh, furry animal, it's, I think it's much more difficult to make them small. Um, mm -hmm because it's, well, it's so fine and everything. But um, otherwise, I mean, I'm using just the paper, the glue and the scissors. I use primarily scissors. Once in a while, I'll use an X-Acto knife. But um, yeah, usually it's a scissors. It's, you know, pretty much otherwise the same, uh, just on that smaller scale. And, and it's fun to, to do both. I really love doing both. Yeah. So I always, I'm one of those people where I lose my scissors all the time because I only have a couple <laughs> pairs. I have to ask, do you have like 10 to 15 pairs of scissors? Because I imagine the blade's dull too. <laughs> I, I do have a lot of scissors, yes, I must admit. And I also actually buy, um, I, I'll buy different types of scissors. You know, there's different ones that um, are made like for, um, so that they open and close differently than other pairs. Uh, so like uh, some are made, uh, like if you have arthritic, you know, issues mm -hmm. or something and I, I try to buy different and there's also I try to buy different ones because each pair of scissors um, feels differently in your hand it cuts differently it feels differently some are harder to maneuver than others so and I also feel like uh, being a paper artist it's good to have a variety of different types of scissors around because um, you know just to be good to my hands you know to um, you know, so that you're not always using the same exact, perhaps. You know, yeah, I assume you can get a break. some muscle fatigue because there's, it's, a, right. it's really, it's interesting. I think I might have actually brought this up uh, in another one of the artist talks, but I had um, an issue at a point um, in the last few years with my hands and some some nerve ending issues. And um, when we discovered that that was the the problem, the neurologist said, asked, well, he asked me if I was an artist. And I thought that kind of odd. And he said, I on, I've only found that um, people with, uh, who work with their hands as an artist or as a musician tend to have as sensitive nerves as you do. So I think it's really good that you're paying attention to that because um, it's really remarkable just how many tiny little muscles there are in our hands. And when you work with your hands, um, you have to take care of them. So I think that's right. really that's really a, a good practice. And there, it's pretty clear that you work with quite a few uh, uh, animal inspirations. So what right. draws you to that? What, what initially got you into this, this theme? I, I've always, uh, ever since I started illustrating, um, I've always uh, illustrated nature scene 
themes. Um, they were usually geared towards children, but I, I am, I'm just really drawn to that. And I also like, uh, especially in recent, uh, like with this installation, for instance, I want to really concentrate on the habitats and how, uh, you know, the habitats that they live in, in and the, the environment around them and how that will affect, you know, like we want to have a good habitats and good environment uh, for the animals. So, um, and I, I like working in the, with the animals because you can put in all those extra little details, like on that iguana one where, where the little ants and the butterflies and the ladybugs, I like adding those little elements of surprise, which I don't know, I just think it's really fun to do that. And I like when uh, you don't always see that right away. And if you keep looking at it, then you start to see, it's like, oh, I didn't, you know, I like when you, it's like, oh, I didn't see that before. And then you, the, you notice that the longer you look at the piece. And I think that's kind of a fun interactive element to my, hopefully, you know, people will find that fun and interactive with my work as well. Yeah, I really appreciate the texture on this piece as well. And it's really interesting how you can achieve so many different types of textures just with paper. Um, you know, obviously there's different types of paper that have their own textures. Um, you know, you can buy paper that has, um, you know, a tooth to it, which is when it's, it's got that more, that's that texture and sort of more raised and surfaces and deep crevices, or you can get one that's really quite smooth. Um, would you say that you vary in the papers that you're using? Um, and, um, you know, is it something that um, is specialized or do you sometimes just reach for any old, copy paper? Um, I use a variety of different papers, but um, I, I prefer to try to add my own uh, details and textures to it. Mm. I, I think that works out best. Um, so uh, yeah, whether you're cutting feathers, you know, or the sand on that piece and the sand on the crab was also hand cut papers. Um, and then like for the iguana, you know, like to add all those textures into it, I, I prefer to just start with the plain, like a plain paper white paper um, and add my own, do my own thing, I guess. Um, that makes sense. I think it's so, it's, it's an extra, it seems like an extra challenge and an, an extra a personal touch that the texture comes from your hand versus from, from the manufacturer of the paper. Um, well, I think that is one of the things that I like about it is I do like the challenge of it. Like when I look, when I decide that I want to, whatever the critter is that I want to make next, I, I think, well, you know, can I do that with paper? And you know, you have to kind of play with it and figure it out. And I, but that is one of the aspects of it that I, I do like. And, and because it is just paper and everybody has paper at their house. And I think that's the other cool thing that, you know, everybody has paper and, you know, you don't look at it, you just think, oh, it's just a piece of paper. And it's like, well, yeah, but look what, you know, think, think of all the things, fun things you can make out of paper that, that all kinds of artists make with paper. I think it's so neat, you know, it's a versatile medium. Absolutely. So we are um, approaching the end of our time, which seems incredible. It's gone by pretty fast, but I want to make sure that um, I leave some, some time if anybody has any questions. Um, so if you do have a question for Melinda, um, feel free, you can pop it in the chat, um, or you can use the raise hand feature, or you can just unmute yourself and ask. We would just love to hear from people and um, um, answer any questions that you may have. Um, again, um, this, uh, these works will be in our Paperworks exhibition, which is opening the day after Labor Day at Strathmore. So we, hope, we do hope that you can join us. Um, we will have um, published information about uh, COVID uh, prevention practices, um, but we do have a lot of um, a lot of policies um, that we're putting in place to make sure that people can stay safe, including limiting the amount of people in the building at the same time. Um, so we do want to assure people uh, that, that that's there. <laughs> so keep an eye on our website, which is strathmore.org. Um, I'm also going to add my email address in the chat for those who um, feel if they want to reach out later too. Um, so someone asked, what is inside the larger sculpture, paper mache? So are you, um, are they hollow? Do they have something inside? Um, is, do you use a paper shame type technique? No, it, it is really just paper and, and glue that's inside. So I take pieces of paper and I, you know, I build up the structure. I make the, like a skeletal um, shape and then I just keep adding layers and, and constructing it. So it is solid. It's, it's, he weighs, the, the dog, Rusty, he weighs probably about 10 pounds, maybe 15. 
but yeah, they're, they're all solid. And I need to make them solid because um, I, I'm afraid that if, as I'm working on it, if, I, if it was hollow, it would, maybe I would accidentally flatten it, you know, squish it. So um, I want them to be solid. And also, you know, if I need to ship the artwork, um, it will, you know, hold up and all of that. So yeah, they're, they're all solid and it is, it's just um, paper and, and glue. Great. And I, I, you know, think about the anatomy of it as I'm, as I'm constructing it. So you're constantly, you know, taking that into consideration as you're building your construction of the, the animals. Great. Well, we've got quite a few thank yous from everyone just saying thank you for joining um, and presenting for us. Um, I do want to say thank you to um, everyone who uh, uh, joined us today. Um, yes. we, we hope that it's, it's brightened your day a little bit. It certainly has mine. Um, and thank you so much to Melinda as well. Thank you for uh, taking the time to share with us. I'm um, laying everything out so beautifully. Um, and we're really excited to see your work in person uh, in September. Well, thank, I want to thank everyone as well for joining. And I really appreciate you taking your time out of your day, uh, you know, to stop in and, and visit Strathmore Art Talks. And I, I think it's just wonderful that they're uh, doing that for everybody uh, to, to have the art talks available for um, their visitors. And I, you know, thank you, Gabrielle and uh, Strathmore for inviting me. And I, I, you know, it'll be nice to see the paperwork show and all the artists. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much once again. Have a great weekend, everyone. And we'll see thank you in you. September. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> Bye. -bye.